So having talked about neo-grammarian sound change and how the axiom of exceptionlessness came about historically, I thought it uh, would be good to talk about the other main uh, way that languages change internally, uh, and that is analogy. So here we go. Analogy and sound change with the emphasis on analogy. So there are two forces internal to language, sound change and analogy. Sound change is a passive result of correctly learning a language. It is totally regular in its application and leads to synchronic anomalies. So returning to an example that I discussed in a previous presentation, we have English was and were cognate with vasati and vasanti in Sanskrit. So everything about the Sanskrit form is regular. There is clarity of the root, vas. There is movement of the accent on the root in the singular, on the ending in the plural. And there's clear personal endings, T for the third singular, NT for the third plural. But nothing about the English form is regular, even though it uh, descended from a form that was more or less the same as what we had in Sanskrit. Uh, regular sound change has obscured that regular morphology. In contrast to sound change, analogy is an active result of incorrectly remembering parts of a language. It is totally capricious in its application, and it leads to greater regularity in terms of morphology. The rest of the presentation will then uh, focus on analogy, and I start by going through the main types. There are three main types of analogy. Those are four-part analogy, contamination, and reanalysis. So taking four-part analogy first, suppose I am in the middle of formulating a sentence and want to say the plural of octopus. Well, I might correctly remember cactus has the plural cacti, but I'm groping for the plural of octopus. So in the traditional notation, I would say cactus is to cacti as octopus is to what? And then I solve for the X with octopi. Because octopus is a Greek third declension noun, the plural in Greek would have been octopodes. So it's understandable that I, <laughs> that I didn't uh, remember that uh, when I was formulating my sentence. Of course, I could have just used the standard English plural and said octopuses. But this uh, analogical plural, octopi, is quite common. So just looking at other examples of four-part analogy... If I don't remember the past tense of help, maybe I will say, well, what's the past tense of Google? The past tense of Google is Googled, so the past tense of help must be helped. Now, this uh, example is, of course, facetious because help is, uh, is an older word than Google. But the point it makes uh, is that regular morphology can also be explained using analogy, and this is a, a way that um, we traditionalists can get around the need for uh, assuming that people in their heads have some kind of representation of roots and affixes. Uh, we can instead uh, just think that analogies are made directly from one surface form to another. The past tense of help was uh, holp and holpen in the past participle. Uh, so some kind of uh, analogy like that is how uh, holp and holpen were replaced with helped. Now, let's suppose we're trying to remember what the past tense of dive is, uh, and we reach for an analogy to strive. We say strive is to strove as dive is to, and then we solve for dove. Well, in this case, uh, the inherited past of dive was dived. This shows us that analogy both can reinforce regular patterns and add new examples to irregular patterns. Anything in the structure of a language is, in principle, available for analogical formation. Now, taking an example from Latin, let's say I want to use the word meaning honor in the nominative and I remember the genitive is honoris, and then I say, well, of a sister is sororis, and the nominative sister is soror, so probably the nominative of honoris is honor. 
Historically speaking, this is incorrect. The nominative corresponding to the genitive honoris was onos with, uh, with an S. Words not perceived as part of a pattern are generally protected from analogy. So uh, in German, the way the adjective near forms its uh, comparative and superlative is na, nea, nächste, and that is the inherited pattern, and the direct cognates of those forms in English are nigh, near, and next. So those three forms have been protected from analogy in the sense that all three continue to exist in the language, but they no longer form a paradigm of plain adjective, comparative, and superlative of, of that adjective. And it's precisely because they don't form that um, parallel that the different morphological forms have been able to continue to exist despite uh, how divergent they become in phonology. So the regular form uh, is near, nearer, and nearest, uh, where the uh, comparative form has uh, been reanalyzed as the simple form, and then fresh morphology has been built on top of it. So this is a nice example of where if elements of a system are forgotten to constitute a system, all of the elements, or at least some of the elements, can survive independently, even as the system is uh, reinvented analogically. To take another example, we have uh, molten bronze, where molten uh, exists as an adjective, even though as a past participle, it has been replaced with melted. And similarly, we can have the phrase cloven hoof, where the past participle cloven is preserved in this fixed expression, uh, even though the past participle uh, productively has been replaced uh, with cleaved. That's all I have to say about four-part analogy, and now I move on to contamination. When terms that present an autonomous semantic system influence each other phonetically, that's what we call contamination. So giving the most famous example, so Middle English had two adjectives borrowed from French. They were male and femelle, uh, from mal and femelle in French. But in uh, modern English, the form female has been uh, changed to look more like the form male. The form of male changing femelle into uh, female because of their closely associated meaning. That's what we call contamination. Another famous example of contamination is found in the Indo-European numeral system. So I give uh, the words four and five in Sanskrit, Greek, and Latin. I leave out Latin five because it, it has some special considerations. Uh, and I also give uh, the Mycenaean Greek version of four so that we get that nice Q in there, which is the uh, labial velar. So chatur and pancha in Sanskrit, kwetoro and pente in um, Greek, quatuor in Latin. So uh, we have strong evidence here for a qua starting the word for four and a pa starting the word for five. Now, when we look at what happens in Proto-Germanic, Indo-European quetuor changes into petuor in uh, Proto-Germanic before the application of Grimm's Law. And then that changes later into fedwar. For five, we have penque uh, becoming first pempe and then fimf. The thing to focus on here is the irregular change of que to pe in Proto-Germanic. Uh, if we had followed the historical phonology regularly, straight from Indo-European down. English should have whore instead of for. So what's going on here is that because four and five are uh, semantically closely related words, the P from five has been copied onto the beginning of the word for four. Such contaminations are extremely common in numeral systems around the world. So those are 
two examples of contamination. And just for a reminder, contamination happens in a semantic subsystem when the form of one element of that subsystem influences the form of another element of that subsystem. The third type of analogy is reanalysis. So a famous example of reanalysis is uh, that the, the word for, for a certain kind of snake, uh, nader in English, we had said a nader, it changes to an adder. And that has to do with, uh, let's say, an ambiguous surface form. So if someone says an adder, you can understand it either as a natter or an adder. Something uh, exactly parallel happened with the word napron, where a napron became an apron. In a third example, uh, the word p, when it was originally borrowed from French, had an s at the end, even in the singular. So we had a p's. And that changed into a P. And that is deletion of the S because it was uh, reanalyzed as a plural suffix in a phrase like the P's. So-called morphologically conditioned sound changes are often due to reanalysis. And I will give a, an example of that, which is the loss of EN in past participles when the root contains a postvocalic nasal. So we say, I have drunk, not I have drunken. So first, I'll point to an author who understands this as a grammatically conditioned sound change. So Seeler says, the designation of a specific morpheme is necessary because some old participles have survived intact as adjectives, shrunken, drunken, sunken, bounden. These and other non-participial forms like Lenten and Linen prove that the phonological sequence alone is insufficient to characterize the condition of loss. The specific morpheme must be designated. So he's saying this sound change sometimes happens and sometimes doesn't happen. Uh, and it seems like then we need to index the specific morpheme in order to know whether or not the sound change happened. But long ago, Otto Jespersen had given a neogrammarian account for this same phenomenon. So he says, if English has, nevertheless, a great number of final ends, it is because it has been protected by a following vowel, either in the same word, where the vowel has subsequently become mute, or in the following word. The later alternation is preserved faithfully in the two forms of the indefinite article. In some words, both forms survive, though not used exactly in the same way. Made, maiden, lent, lenten, drunk, drunken, sunk, sunken. So to paraphrase his argument, he's saying that right after the change, we had, he hath spoken a, but he hath spoke the. So the occurrence of the two biforms was entirely phonetically conditioned. But it's clear that this would have been a, a difficult rule to learn, which is why there, there arose the opportunity to semantically differentiate uh, these doublets. Thank you. That's all for now.